I would like to build an app similar to Uber and Lyft, but highly specialized for a particular group of people. Hello, this is Daniel Haney and welcome to The Breakdown. This is a series where we take your startup ideas and break them down to make sure you know what you're getting into. So you have an idea for an on-demand transportation app where a passenger on demand can hail a taxi, cab, or some vehicle to take them from point A to point B. Now, in this particular scenario, you may have specialized groups of people where it could be the elderly, people need medical care, or so on. But what we'll do is we'll make it a little bit more generic so more of us can benefit from this. Many of you know, I know this system extremely well. One of my previous startups was called Flywheel. And basically, Flywheel was Uber for taxis before Uber was Uber. And back then, we really didn't want to ruffle any feathers, so we made sure that we followed guidelines of local uh, rules and regulations to make sure that we weren't breaking any laws. So we went down the taxi system where we had to deal with MTS regulations and so on. However, the fundamental idea of taking a passenger from A to B on demand still holds. So we're going to draw upon that experience so that you're fully equipped to handle the challenges and hurdles coming your way. So let's break down the entities that make up your system. So you have a passenger, a driver, some vehicle. The driver plus the vehicle make up the taxi. And then you have a hail, which is the request to be picked up. And once that request is accepted, you then have an order. Now let's start with the system and technical challenges that you may have. Now imagine this. Imagine you have a map that has a passenger and three different available vehicles to you. Now, the first thing you want to do is once that passenger actually places that order, now you want to make sure that that passenger has the best experience, which means taking me from point A to point B in the fastest and safest way possible. Now, initially, once a passenger requests a cab, that creates a hail. Basically, think of it as a digital version of somebody lifting up their hand and saying, hey, please, taxi, stop. I want to go from A to B. Now, that'll go out to the closest drivers. And the question is, does it go out to the closest driver first? And if they decline, it goes to the next. And if they decline, it goes to the next. Or does it go to all available vehicles within a particular radius? So that's determining whether you have serial hailing or parallel hailing. Serial meaning going one after the other or parallel all happening at the same time. Now, what are the problems here? If you did serial hailing, you're only asking one taxi at a time if they'd like to accept this order, which gives you better data quality, but it slows down the process. Now, if you do parallel hailing, that means everybody in a particular radius will receive the hail at the same time. Now, the question is, is the first person who accepts it the one receiving that order? That may not be the closest taxi. You may inadvertently train your drivers to automatically accept hails before they actually look at it. So what ends up happening is everybody races to accept. They look at the order and say, ah, you know, I don't want it and cancel, which causes a bad user experience for the passenger. So let's say we went down the parallel side and we said multiple people accepted the order. Do you then have some sort of algorithm that says, okay, three people said yes to this particular order. Who should we assign it to? Now, if it's just the shortest distance, what defines the shortest distance? The way the crow flies or an actual route? How accurate is that route? Imagine this map had a cul-de-sac blocking one of the streets. The shortest distance based on the way the crow flies is not actually the closest to the passenger through valid routes. Now, if you chose to do routing for every single vehicle to this passenger, imagine the toll that you put on your servers and the amount of money you're going to pay Google or MapQuest or whichever service you're going to use in order to just figure out who's the closest taxi to the passenger. Now, also, these APIs take time, whether you're doing a serial hailing, which is going to take time, or you do routing, which takes more and more time. Here's a really important point you need to remember. You're dealing with moving targets, not static targets. They're not in place. So one of these vehicles, if they go left versus right, makes a big difference whether they are now closer to the passenger or further away. If they make a right and go down a bridge, it may be a several miles before they can do a U-turn. That's where you're dealing with data that has a very short shelf life. 
What does that mean? If you take a snapshot of all the vehicles, the validity of their locations is only valid for a few seconds. Because like I said, a right turn versus a left turn makes a world of a difference. The other thing is, there are rules and regulations in place in many cities that are vastly different than others. For example, in Las Vegas, you cannot hail a cab on the strip. You can't just wave your hand and have them stop. They have to be picked up at particular locations in hotels or designated areas. If you're picking up at an airport, which lane are you allowed to pick up on? Are you paying the airport gate? If you notice, cabs and buses and shuttles go down a different route at the airport because they have to pay a fee to the airport to maintain those lanes. Does your system skip that? Is that legal? Now all this is dealing with on-demand hailing. If you're dealing with future orders, placing an order for a future pickup, you have multiple problems. One, the area where I'm at now may not be the place I want to pick up. Two, the place and time I get picked up at in the future could be in different daylight savings time. Whether an hour exists or doesn't exist is actually hours on the calendar that don't exist with daylight savings. Also, it could technically be in a different time zone. There are many states where a time zone splits them right down the middle, where you have a city, one street is in one, one time zone and another street is in another. And actually, it gets even more complex than that. If you look at the Kentucky, Indiana area, where you'll cross state lines that change time zones and whether that city adheres to daylight savings or not. So just imagine the mess you'd be dealing with. And furthermore, who says there are any cabs available at that time? Tomorrow at 6 a.m. may be rush hour for some reason and there are none available. But if you previously booked, what happens? Do you reserve the driver from now? Who says that driver doesn't get sick? How does it go off to somebody else or not? Does it get reassigned? What happens? Now, if I'm booking in the future, I'm extra sensitive because I told you ahead of time, I need a cab tomorrow at 6 a.m. I'm going to the airport. You'll be surprised how many people come to my company Buildfire with a few thousand dollars and say, hey, I, I want an app like Uber. That, that's just a map with some vehicles on it. It's super simple, right? You'll be surprised how many times I have to educate my customers about that. Go to market strategy. How do you take this system once you've built it, you figured out all the technical issues and you build it and you want to take it to market, how do you do that? If you have passengers where you spend a lot of marketing dollars to get people to download your app and they open up the app and there's no taxis, they're not using your app again. Imagine you get all these drivers to download your app and start uh, participating in your hailing system and they open up the first day, no orders, second day, no orders, they're not using your system. So you have the classic chicken and the egg problem. Which one comes first, the chicken or the egg, the passenger or the drivers? It's a big issue. How do you get both at the same time so that supply matches demand? Now in the taxi industry, you can go to existing cab companies who already have taxis and just tack on to it. So you automatically have the drivers before you have the passengers and that's fine because they're going about their business anyway. However, in a system like Uber or Lyft, this is the gig economy. People will try it once and twice and then if I'm not making money here, I'm wasting my time. I need to go somewhere else. Now, without mentioning any company names, some companies would create what we call a virtual cars or fake bots. They're little AI bots that show up on the map as if they're real vehicles so that it looks like supply will match the demand. Again, don't want to mention the names of the companies, but I've seen on a map a vehicle on my phone look like it's passing right in front of me when the street was empty. Now, in some cases, you can get away with that in your early stages. However, you need to be very careful not to break the law doing something like that. The other part is, if your app is successful, it may be successful in San Francisco and may not be successful yet in Los Angeles. But it's close enough in region where people may hear about your app and open it up in Los Angeles and then have a bad experience. How do you deal with that? Now, you should uh, unlock zones of your app, have heavy marketing in one particular region, and then move on to adjacent regions or, or where you have high demand. So you could put a message on your app that says, coming soon to your area, and keep that data. The more and more people are hitting these unopened areas, you know that's a hotspot. The next region to open, 
is probably Los Angeles if you're getting a lot of hits there. Before we continue, make sure you like and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest content. Next is monetization. This is not a charity you want to make money. How are you going to make money? Well, you have two entities. You can charge the passenger. You can charge the driver. You can charge both if you really wanted to. What's the right thing to do? Now, at the end of the day, if you're charging a passenger, you're taking the fee for the driver and adding on a particular fee that covers your cost. If you're charging the driver, then it's more of a referral fee for the driver that I got you a order, I got you a hail that you otherwise wouldn't have, and now I'm taking a fee off the top from you. Now, in both scenarios, you don't want to go after the passenger or the driver trying to collect your fee. Generally speaking, you are the merchant on file, which means when a credit card gets swiped, when a credit card gets charged, it's going to your merchant account. So you get 100% of the fee, 100% of the transaction, and then you disperse out the cost of the ride minus your fees. But then how do you disperse it out? Do you disperse it out per transaction? Do you do it once a day? Do you do it once a month? How does that work? Does the driver have to have a bank account that is linked to yours so you can issue it? Are you going to send out paper checks? Is there a minimum amount that you disperse? Even if it's just a few dollars, you still cut a check and send it off? Sometimes the amount that it costs you to cut a low dollar amount check costs you more than the value of the check. What do you do with clawbacks? What happens if a passenger says I was wrongly charged or um, I didn't like the, uh, the service that was provided to me. I want a refund. But when they're issued a refund, that comes from you, not from the driver. How do you call that back from the driver? Do you issue 1099s to drivers? Well, it depends on the state that you're in. How much did you issue? Did they pass that threshold to issue a 1099 for them so that they have to file their own taxes and you have to file a 1099 on their behalf? Also, dealing with the credit card transaction. Early on at Flywheel, what we did is at the end of the ride, we, we charged the customer's credit card. Now that had several problems. One, it was a friction at the end of the ride that they had to take out their card if they didn't have it before, make sure that they registered. And there was a transaction that occurred at the end where people just wanted to get up and leave. Uh, and the other thing is, what if they're not good for it? What if the amount on the credit card is, is not available? Their credit card's maxed out. So what you do is you have to authorize the card prior to the ride, just like you do at a gas station. When you go to a gas station, you swipe your card first, then fill up gas. And basically what gas stations do is they take an average order size, let's call it $50 to fill up your tank. I'm in California. So they pre-authorize, they freeze $50, they ensure you have $50 on your card, and then if you fill up $30, it only charges $30 and releases the, the 20. If you don't, if you swipe and you never filled up at all, after a certain amount of time, it just releases the $50. So same thing with these rides. You look at your average ride per your region. You authorize that. You pre-authorize that on the credit card, which means you reserved it. You froze those funds, but you technically did not take the money yet because that's illegal. Then once the driver picks them up and delivers them, that's where you say, well, the ride was $27 plus whatever tip that you want to leave plus my fees. This is the total amount. And then you can actually uh, charge that credit card. And for the passenger, all they have to do is just get up and go out of the car, just like you would at Flywheel, Uber, or Lyft. You just get up and leave. Do you have an idea for a startup that you would like me to break down? Send it to me in the comments or direct message me, and I'll be happy to make an episode breaking down your system. And that is how you break down a system.